Last time, I shared a disturbing 1974 paranormal case where two couples moved into an old house after graduating college. Their names were George and Tina Martell and Rick and Anna Delapina. This house seemed like a great deal, especially with all the antique furniture that was included, including a mysterious painting above the fireplace of a beautiful woman who used to live in the house. However, within the first week, they faced a flurry of supernatural events. From the sound of unseen gunshots in the driveway and footsteps, to poltergeist activity, to two full-on attacks. One in the bedroom where Anna claimed to be strangled by some sort of malevolent demon, and another in the fruit cellar where George went to grab a jar of fruit from the basement and something slammed into him at force and both he and George claimed they could hear the sound of frantic animal breathing. Only there was nothing visible in the cellar. What was going on in this case that was first told to the paranormal investigator Brad Steiger and what would happen next? Well, find out with me, Peter Laws, as we conclude our two-part look at The Thing in the House. As we ended last time, I mentioned that Rick and Anna's parents had decided to come and stay in the house. They wanted to check out this new bargain home. Well, there was an added element of anticipation about this visit because even before they set foot in this house, Anna had always said to the others that her mum was sensitive to the paranormal, that she was psychic and had medium type abilities and was known in the family for making accurate predictions about events and affecting them. Anna remarked how she had accepted this unique side of her mother. She'd grown up with her in the 1960s. That was a decade when it became more and more acceptable and even, frankly, cool to indulge in pastimes like astrology and tarot cards, uh, both of which Anna's had used, Anna's mum had used quite a lot before. So when Deirdre, Anna's mum, arrived in the house, they were eager to see what she would say. And immediately, this woman in her late 50s stopped dead in the reception area and started to shiver. She whispered to Anna, there is evil here. Now, Anna tried to make light of it, made a joke saying, yeah, thanks very much, Mom. That's uh, just what we wanted to hear in our new house. But Deirdre was serious. She walked by the fireplace in the living room, which is where the painting of the lady of the house was hanging. It was supposedly she stared at these blue eyes of this lady for a while and she said, this is the mistress of the mansion. In fact, at that point, she started to look around the room and said things like, there's lots of other people in this house. You share this house with others. Deirdre seemed used to this sort of thing, this sort of talk, mentioning the presence of many dead spirits as if it was perfectly normal. But Anna was understandably afraid. She got that claustrophobic sense of walking through a large house but sliding past other unseen people. That's a creepy thought, deeply unnerving. At dinner that night, Deirdre started to share the details that were coming through to her. She claimed that the woman in the portrait had been having an affair behind her husband's back and with one of his uh, business part partners. And Deirdre insisted that the sounds of the house could be explained by this situation. For example, the shot, the gunshots that they heard in the driveway was an echo from where the portrait woman's husband had shot her lover. Yet actually she claimed he lived Deirdre said that this husband then went into panic, um, thinking that he'd be arrested and it led to a struggle on the stairs. And she said where the lady, uh, the portrait lady fell down during this struggle and the husband realizing he killed his wife was horrified at what he had done. And so he went into the basement and hanged himself. This is what Deirdre felt she was drawing in from the house. And she started listing all the other entities that were there, a poisoned woman, another man who fell on the stairs and died. She said she was getting a sense of a man running through the house screaming that he was being chased by some sort of monster or creature. And Deirdre even added this chilling detail. She said a young child had died in the house, apparently from pneumonia. But she said it wasn't pneumonia, that some malevolent creature was stalking this child when she lived here. So Anna listened to all of this quietly 
And then she mentioned the more horrifying experiences that they had had, including the attack in the bedroom. Deirdre thought for a moment and shook her head. She said, this is not some ghost. This was a demon, an evil type entity. It's certainly not human. So as they were sitting around this table, there was an awkward silence and all this talk of monsters and ghosts and whatnot may have sounded too much to some, but Tina cleared her throat and finally admitted that she had also encountered what she would describe as a grotesque, hairy beast in the hallway one night. She said to the others that she saw it waiting for her, like with dark bristles and saying it was as big as Rick or George, but it was hunched over, like bent over with with these weird fingernails and that it was ugly and twisted. And she thought, is it her imagination? Is she seeing things? At this point in the meal, Deirdre's husband just said, that's enough. He's called Fred Seavers, by the way. And um, he said, look, we're all going to have nightmares if we keep talking about this stuff. Let's go to bed. But before he did this, he said, hold my hand. And he reached out and he grabbed the hands of everyone in the, at the table, the two couples and his wife. And he was deeply, deeply religious. And he prayed that God would protect them as they slept in the house that night. The prayer seemed to work because there was no more activity in the house that night and into the next day. Yet despite the relative quiet, Deirdre eventually took Anna and Tina aside in the kitchen while preparing dinner on the Saturday night and said, look, I don't want to upset you, but I know that you are living here to save money, but you've got to get out of this house. There is something inhuman that lives here. It's not just the departed spirits. There is something evil and inhuman here. And she said, I'm not easily frightened, but whatever this creature is has me absolutely petrified. Well, Deirdre was about to find out just how terrified she should be of this entity the next afternoon. It happened on the next afternoon when Anna's parents were preparing to leave the house. Deirdre was in the living room near to the fireplace where the painting was and uh, she suddenly seemed to fall to the floor only it didn't look like a fall it looked like she had been grabbed and shoved down with unseen hands and just like what had happened to Anna in the bedroom at the start of all this Deirdre started rolling around in the fireplace at the fireplace grabbing at her throat Tina told the investigator Steiger this quote we stood helplessly watching and you have to appreciate when you see stuff like this your your brain can shut down you know it's so insane what you're watching well george and rick eventually came to their senses and tried to drag off whatever was attaching itself to deirdre but again just like before they were somehow shoved and pushed away and they staggered into a slump against the antique furniture scattered around the room fred deirdre's husband was outside at this point loading up the car to leave with luggage so he didn't get to see Deirdre pushed over but he certainly heard the screaming and so he ran back in the house and there he saw his wife writhing on the floor again remember he's a religious man he started to call out in the name of God demanding that the thing whatever it was release his wife and Tina said there was a rush of cold air in the room and then they heard Deirdre greedily gasping for breath as her throat seemed to finally be clear of this unseen pressure. Now, Fred was understandably forceful in what he said next. He looked at them all and he said, you kids have moved into a hell house. Get out as quickly as you can. Before they left, they spoke to Deirdre about the experience and she said that before she was pushed, she had been standing at the fireplace, gazing at the portrait on the wall and she'd been attempting some sort of telepathic communication with this lady in the portrait. But as she tried to do that, she said she felt this evil creature rush out of the shadows and attack her. And she also added this detail. She said that the hands on her throat clearly had some sort of claws. She was adamant. She said, you've got to get out. You've got to get out. And with this warning, she mentioned a dream she had also had last night saying that this house is going to eventually burn to the ground. With this fresh warning in in their minds, the two couples were starting to think that, yes, perhaps the time really has come to leave, but they didn't do it straight away. They pondered this all for a couple of days. 
until the final incident pushed them both, both couples, completely over the edge. Anna and Rick had been lying in bed when they both felt something crawl in and under the covers, something small. And before they could think straight, Anna said she felt something like teeth clamping into her foot. They tore off the cover in the darkness and they couldn't tell exactly what this thing was they were looking at. It was certainly some sort of animal, but was it a bat? Was it an owl? They simply couldn't tell. George said it looked like a crow. Rick grabbed a tennis racket and managed to smack it off a few times and then it flew off into the hallway and smashed into some glass through through a window and then was gone. Now, if that had been the only incident, uh, I'm, I'm sure that many people would just put that down to a freak animal attack. Scary, but not necessarily enough to leave. But seeing a substantial physical creature with malicious intent on top of all of the other experiences before it and the warnings from Deirdre, that was the final straw. The two couples started to move out of the house the very next day as they relayed this to the investigator Steiger. We didn't care if we'd have to stay in a motel for a while until we found something decent, they said. They just wanted to get out. And the house stood empty for 10 more days until a storm happened and a lightning, a a bolt of lightning hit part of the house and caused a flash of ignition and a small fire did grow and set off a huge fire in the house, just as Deirdre said it would. Now... These two couples were out of that place and the house was, well, you could say no more. You'd think that therefore that was the end of the story. Think again. Rick and Anna and George and Tina managed to find some apartments in different areas of the city. And they were actually really pleasantly surprised uh, with what they managed to get for their money. And they thought, you know what, this is this is time for us to have a fresh and happy new start. And even though they were living in separate places, they had bonded even more due to the activity in the home. And so they would get together every few weeks for a movie or a meal. And they decided that they would not talk about their experiences. Occasionally they did, but on the whole, they didn't mention it. Maybe you think you would do that. Maybe you think you'd be talking loads. But for them, they felt talk of it would be risky as if discussion of the activity may somehow rouse it again. That's actually not an uncommon thought, people who experience that. Maybe like mentioning it out loud would get the attention of this unwanted personality and that it would reach out for them a second time. So they chose to talk about work and movies and football games. And this worked for about six months until Anna called Tina one night. Tina said she picked up the phone and Anna was sobbing hysterically. Tina asked what was wrong, and yes, she explained. She'd been in her new apartment alone one night while Rick was out working late. And her eyes just happened to glance into the corner of the room, and there was something there, standing and watching her. A small, leering creature thing, like a demon or a troll or whatever the hell it was. She said it was standing there with eager eyes in the shadows, fixed on her, and then it was gone. She chose not to tell Rick about this, but then three nights later, they found their bedclothes had been torn, like a wild animal had ravaged them. Please imagine that for a moment, that you go to your bed tonight, nobody else in the house, and you find your pillow in ribbons. Well, Anna said she'd asked her mum to come over at that point, and when she did, Deirdre felt the presence immediately, and she said, this is the same presence as you experienced in the house. It's followed you. You have got to leave. They did. They weren't ready to stick around anymore. So Rick and Anna just went for it. They moved to a a new place, which was a good deal further from where they were both doing their teaching jobs. But they said the safety of uh, their new home was worth the long commute. But the safety didn't last long. Around four to five months had passed before activity started in that house as well. It was like, it was like Anna and Rick, uh, though particularly Anna, was, was a beacon to this thing, a magnet. It got so bad that the couple 
decided to move again, only this time they moved way further to northern Michigan, hundreds of miles away. A move that required them to get new teaching jobs. It was insanely disruptive, this experience. And there must have been a cruel sense of hope over that next year because through it, nothing happened and all seemed well until a year had passed. It was This was 1977 at this point. And Tina told Anna that strange things were starting to happen again. For example, Rick was sleeping one night when he felt a pressure on his chest, like something was scratching at his face playfully. Was this just the natural phenomenon of sleep paralysis? Maybe. But with everything they'd been through, understandably, they thought it was something much, much worse. Especially when the couple started to become plagued with horrific and frightening dreams. And so they moved again. What else could you do, I suppose? This time they went to New York, figuring living in a big populated city much further away might be the only answer. And strangely enough, they seemed to be right. After they moved to New York, they didn't experience anything like that ever again. As for George and Tina, however, they may have thought they had escaped the horrors of that house until something happened in 1978 that shook that sense of safety to the core. You see, George and Tina not only kept in touch with Rick and Anna because they were great friends, but also with Rick and Anna's parents, Deirdre and Fred Seavers. All six people had been through a lot together. And so in 1978, George and Tina went to visit the Seavers at their rural, rural home, which was a beautiful lodge by the lake, surrounded by dense woods. Now, by this time, George and Tina's son, Timmy, was three years old. And Tina was pregnant with a little girl called Lisa. Tina had just put Timmy down to bed for the night and they had returned uh, with her and her husband and the two Seavers um, when they were chatting about politics. Apparently around the time uh, President Carter was just arranging an important summit at Camp David and this got them all really animated. So they were discussing Jimmy Carter at that time when suddenly the moment was invaded by a hideous scream from Timmy, the young boy. They all leapt out of their seats and raced into the guest room where he was staying, and when they pushed the door open, they froze because in the darkness, they saw it again. Something shuffling out of the shadowy corner of the room toward the child in the bed. They were convinced this bizarre demonic figure that had attacked Deirdre and Anna in the house was now here. And as insane as it sounds, Deirdre leapt at this thing and started actually grappling with it. She could physically touch it. George and Steiger thought at first that, that Fred had lost his nerve because he got scared and ran out of the room, but actually he returned very soon after holding a 12-gauge shotgun and a flashlight. And he held it like this and shone it into the thing's face in the darkness. And he shoved the barrel into the stomach of this thing, pulled the trigger, <laughs> explosion fills the room. But when the flash of the shot died away, they said they saw absolutely nothing. They could smell something for sure, foul and filled with the stench of decay, that same kind of fetid, horrible odor that had happened in the house on the stairs. And so sickening was it that they were all hit with a wave of nausea, so they couldn't breathe. And so they all had to get out of the room bring the kid with them and George and Tina immediately grabbed their stuff and said there was no way they were staying in that house not with two children to care for. A week later a fire broke out in the Seavers home but after that nothing else occurred. Why did this thing appear in the first place and why did it treat these people with such malice who knows what was it? A ghost, a demon, an elemental style goblin? Or was it, of course, a figment of their imagination? If so, they had witnessed many of these things at the same time. So was it just a story they told Steiger to fool him? Nobody can be truly sure, but Steiger pointed out that what was interesting about this creature was that it really seemed to focus on Anna and her mother, Deirdre. Deirdre having a psychic gift. Did that make Anna more in tune with those things too, that she had inherited some sort of sensitivity so they could see more to this haunting perhaps than your average person could. 
If this was just a wild story that Steiger was told by two people, then two couples, then perhaps we could treat it as an action-packed ghost story, a legend. But Steiger was convinced that these couples were not lying to him and that the evidence of the trauma in their faces as they told their accounts, he found very persuasive. Which means if it really did happen, it is one of the most baffling and threatening and disturbing cases of paranormal activity I've heard for a while. So what do you think was going on in this house and beyond? And why did it follow those people? Let me know. But for now, I'm Peter Laws, and you've been listening to The Thing in the House. <laughs>